And welcome everybody to the ABT Time Podcast. This is episode number something or other. Um, it is three o'clock in California, which means that it must be 8 a.m. in Melbourne, Australia, home of my wonderful co-host, Dr. Jen Martin. Good morning, Jen. How is everything in Melbourne? Good morning, Randy. Uh, we've had some most amazing spring weather here until today. So I'm feeling sad because I look out the window and it's kind of drizzly and cold and not very exciting. But oh my goodness, spring in Melbourne, you've got to come over sometime, Randy. It's just delightful. I can only imagine. What, what were you saying a while ago about you haven't been able to see downtown for quite a while because of the lockdown? Yeah, so we've had kind of zones of distances you're allowed to travel from your home during our lockdown. So we're still in lockdown now, but restrictions are gradually easing. So for a long time, I haven't been able to go more than five kilometres from my home. Um, and I don't live within five kilometres of the CBD. So I haven't seen the city for, for quite a while, even though I work there normally. So one day I'll get back. Um, the CBD would be marijuana oil what <laughs> cbd central business district city ah, you know gotcha. the, we, we don't use downtown we, sorry downtown's not in my vocabulary okay. the city <laughs> i'm gonna go to the cbd and take some cbd oil and rub it on my oh. um <laughs> wonderful all right so we have got today's episode is going to be a huge amount of fun and it's just going to be a somewhat unstructured chit chat session with two great friends of mine both of whom just are... just for a change, Randy, an unstructured <laughs> chit chat with friends of yours. That sounds very familiar. And add to that a, a disorganized introduction of their backgrounds, which they're going to have to correct all the things I get wrong as usual. But these are two great and accomplished actors who are buddies of mine. Uh, both also have a, a connection and interest in the AB team. We'll be getting into that uh, in lots of detail. And I want to begin by just, just so I get something right about each of them, I'm going to take one paragraph of bio from uh, both of them. They both, uh, as I say, are accomplished actors with careers going back quite a ways. So here is our first guest is Julie Carmen, who actually is kind of a triple threat. She's both actor and certified family marriage therapist from the state of California, and then also a longtime yoga instructor, and now kind of a pioneer in the whole field of yoga therapy. She teaches at Loyola Marymount University. We've been buddies for about 12 years, and she has taken part in a bunch of the uh, kind of ABT stuff that I've done. We've had lots of discussions, and also I've ended up um, trying to help her at times with presentations that she gives. We'll talk about some of that. But here's one little sample of her uh, acting career. Uh, she has starred in a variety of films, including Gloria, directed by John Cassavetti's legendary director. And I, I believe she was nominated, maybe even got the Best Actress Award at the Venice, Venice Film Festival for that. Uh, Night of the Juggler, comeback. Uh, she starred in opposite Eric Burden of Eric Burden and the Animals. Awesome, <laughs> iconic character from World of Rock Music. Uh, Last Plane Out, Condo, Blue City. She was one of the lead actors in Robert Redford's movie that he directed, The Milagro Beanfield War, which is iconic also in the world of environmental stories. Uh, and then showing her range and diversity, she starred in Friday Night, uh, Fright, sorry, Fright Night Part Two uh, as vampire Regine Dandridge. And she has a whole following in the world of, of horror films from that performance. Uh, she was in Painted Black, uh, John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, I think with Sam O'Neill. I've watched that film. It's great. She was on NYPD Blue, King of the Jungle, opposite John Leguizamo. Uh, she starred in Dawn Patrol, You Can't Say No, opposite Peter Fonda. And then I think just a couple of years ago, a movie called Windows on the World, opposite Edward James Olmos. So uh, we'll bring her on lots of uh, more stories to be told. And then our other guest is uh, Jose Angel Santana who took part in the, I believe the second round of the ABT framework course last year. That's when I first met him. And it's not coincidence that he would be in the course. He's really got a, a deep background in acting and in narrative structure. And so he was kind of pre-programmed for the course. And from the very beginning, we started conversations. And some of these people, you kind of have to sell them on the idea. Others come in already like, I, I got this. I already know this whole stuff. Uh, I just have never had this, this kind of model and framework to put on it. Here's um, just one paragraph from his bio. As a young actor, Jose Angel Santana received critical acclaim for his heartbreaking debut performance as Jose the Junkie in Sydney, Sydney Lumet's Prince of the City. 
He's remembered as the strange boutique owner with Madonna in the 80s cult classic movie that I love, Desperately Seeking Susan. Among his other feature performances in film are Benny and Batteries Not Included with Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin, along with roles in Nighthawks, The Pope of Greenwich Village, Garbo Talks, The Morning After with Jane Fonda, just tons of great movies he's been in over the years. He also became an acting instructor at NYU, uh, I think mostly working with directors, uh, teaching them acting. And now he's moved to Los Angeles, where he is now uh, an instructor at USC Cinema School, where he's teaching um, part of the 508 course that I took uh, 27 years ago. And he and I have had some very entertaining discussions about that. So we've got a little treat here to get started with, which is, um, you know, uh, Julie Carmen has tons of fans for her acting work over the ages and all kinds of fanboys and fangirls. And we managed to find one fangirl that we're going to bring on here right now before we bring on our guests. Um, can we introduce, can you join us there, fangirl Julie Clausen, um, who's also a fisheries biologist and the <laughs> organizer and sponsor of the current round of the ABT framework course, round 17. And it turns out when I mentioned to her that we were going to have this special guest of Julie Carmen, who starred in the Milagro Beanfield War, she said, oh my goodness, one of my all-time favorite movies. So on that note, Julie Carmen, can you join us? And we're going to let Julie Clausen start the interview and discussion process. Uh, Julie Clausen, take it away. There's our star. I, I don't get very many fangirl moments as a fish biologist, so this is pretty special <laughs> for me, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I um, I was telling Randy just what a significant um, memory the Milagro Beanfield War was for me. You know, I was an Iowa farm girl and was not exposed to outside cultures at all growing up. You know, it was just, you know, the, your standard, you know, just standard white, you know, Iowa farmer. That was my culture. And so when I watched the Milagro Beanfield War, you know, I grew up in a farm. I grew up in a small town. I grew up in a very Catholic small town, um, but you know there was no cultural diversity. And so seeing this story through the Latino culture and the magic realism, you know, it it there was just this connection that I I still remember to this day watching that movie, and uh, you know, and, and that you were a part of that. It was really a um, really really special um, a moment for me. Oh my goodness, that's really heartwarming to hear, Julie Clausen. Um, did were the people who worked on the farm Latino? On my farm, no, 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 no. It was a, it was a family farm that uh, you know we had seven kids. The kids worked on the farm, so yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because since a lot of the farm families in Truchas, New Mexico, north of Santa Fe, where we shot Milagro Beanfield War a lot of those families have moved into Santa Fe or Albuquerque and mm -hmm. uh, the family plots were being divided and sold off so each of the kids could get a piece. And then that has uh, diluted some of the culture which dates back to the Inquisition. Actually, the population there were direct descendants of the Basque uh, penitentes who, who uh, fled the Inquisition. Uh, in 1498 and 1500, for, for around there, por ahí, I was saying. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the dance, the whittling of the way they whittle, the way they weave, the way they tend sheep, a lot of their recipes are um, from the back, very similar to Basque culture. So all those, interesting. All those traditions. Um, yeah. yeah. You, you so know, I, uh, I, let, me, let me toss in one thing on, I grew up in Kansas and in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, and there was no Latino workers then. And I think today, you know, they really do run the farms, as you were saying. And I know Thomas Frank's books, What's the Matter with Kansas 2006, had a whole chapter in there, I think, about Dodge City and how everything in Dodge City, it's all Mexican-American community out in western Kansas now running all of those, uh, all the actual labor, uh, you know, different organizations and everything. So the culture has really changed like that. And I'm guessing, Julie, it was the same thing with you, that you were Kind of growing yeah, up. I grew I grew up to tasseling corn, and that's what we did to raise our tuition money to go to college. And now, you know, it's it it's too hard to work for kids, and they a huge migrant populations come up and, and work the fields in the summer. So yeah, complete change from when I was growing up. Well, one of the two philanthropic organizations I do support um, fully is one called Farm Workers Justice. 
-hmm. which is a, it's 40 years old and they um, fight for the health and safety laws protecting farm workers because imagine during COVID, they're essential workers. We all still expected to go to, um, to the supermarket and get food, but they were not given PPE. They were not given sanitizing masks or hand sanitizers. They were still like eight people in a studio apartment. There was no social distancing. They were not given ex extra pay for overtime and they were not given health insurance or immigration pathway to citizenship. So it, you know, I, f I support farm workers justice, but that's all the advocacy I'll bring up today. We're supposed to be- No, no, that, that's not all. We're gonna, we'll get into that later some more. So sorry about that. But uh, you know what, on a parallel note, Jen, has there been that sort of shift in, in farm workers in Australia in demographics over the past three decades or so? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I didn't grow up on a farm, so I, I don't have a lot of inside knowledge, but certainly something that's really come to fore <clears throat> in the last two years has been when we haven't had all of these international workers coming from overseas because of COVID, suddenly there's been farms that just don't have enough workers <clears throat> to pick the fruit. And, you know, there's been a really big issue that there's, there's fruit and, and all sorts of other things that, you know, need to be picked or there's work that needs to be done and there, there aren't enough people to do it. Where, where do they normally come all of our from? migrant workers. Where, where uh, they... Lots of Southeast Asian um, countries. Yeah, quite, look, it's quite diverse, people who come here. But all of a sudden when international travel has been pretty much completely off the card, in Australia, it's it's changed the dynamic hugely. Wow, um, <laughs> I'm not going to make. No, I, I have a question for Julie. Yes. Um, Go for it. So, were you aware when you were making Milagro Bean Field War of that ability to connect, you know, people from completely different worlds, and uh, and really have that impact on on someone, on on someone like you? <laughs> uh huh. Um, absolutely not. I am in such a little Zen bubble when I am doing anything and, and I work so much from my unconscious that I really try to lock off any awareness of how this film will be received, any expectations, any hopes, any predictions. And um, it was a really fun shoot. And one of the most fun parts of it was our B camera. The, the man, now I'm not, I don't know who was the, the name of the cinematographer 30 years ago on B camera, but I should know because he was in Africa. He, he worked a lot in Africa and literally he would show up at four or five in the morning and just see, wait for the birds to wake up and fly across the morning sky. And we were there for like 16 weeks and we would just all go to dailies, but we would wait for B camera because it was jaw dropping. So oh, wow. the nature of cinematography was extraordinary. Wait, wait, where was where was there? Where was the location? Um, we shot in Truchas, which is north of Chimayo. Oh. We stayed. They, he got us all condos. Um, Sonia Braga and I, and uh, Ruben Blades and Freddie Fender, and um, you know Chick Venera, who just passed away. Um, we all had condos in this little area um, in Santa Fe, and then they'd pick us up, and we'd see the sunrise as the van would take us all over the hills for an hour driving to the location. And then we'd see the sunset, you know, coming back down. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous part of the world. Um, and how much did, um, you know, that was when Redfield really was starting to come into a stride for environmental issues. Um, and that was really kind of a passion project for him, the environmental side of it, I think. Um, did he talk to all of you a lot about the, the issue side of the, what the movie was saying? Um, I don't know the chronology of when Robert Redford became an environmentalist, and I'd have to say it was way before that. Um, you no, know, I, I know he was always environmentalist, but what was it? Was the late 80s? That, that, when was the movie released? Well, we shot it in 86. Yeah. And we, it was released in 88. And uh, he would drive there from Utah in his silver Porsche. Yeah. And, you know, he... He, I, I always so just, just to put those comments in context, um, in the late 80s, 1988 was when I started as professor, and there was a big resurgence of environmental interest in Hollywood. There were tons and tons of articles because Hollywood had been active environmentalists in the 70s, and then it had gone away through the Reagan era in the 80s, and then you know Reagan exited in 88 from office, and that's when suddenly Hollywood jumped back in, and that that film was a part of that whole re rebirth of environmental concern for Hollywood. So that's that's why I asked that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a woman named Bonnie Reese who was in, you know, a, a, a lot of dear friends were advocating and pushing um, the green and there was a bill, uh, the prop, a proposition, there were the, the big green proposition, there were a lot of well, that, that was when Norman Lear started his Echo Earth Communication Office. And I think Bonnie Reese was a part of that, maybe. Um, and that was bringing together all these Hollywood folks to start doing activist type stuff. And they, they had a good run there into the, the 90s. So um, that and we were all we were all given talking points. Then it was done right. I mean, Cesar Chavez really trained me to do it right. He would hand me um, and some of the women that were supporting his whole system in Dolores Huerta, they, they would hand me a, a sheet of paper with talking points and all the research supporting it so any any celebrity who had interest to really go deep we would really know what we were talking about so when we got in front of some camera talking about some movie release we were able to you know say something that had validity and and wow. I, I respect those days when when we were really supported by the ngos um, that that's awesome. Uh, okay, and Julie Clausen, go ahead and stay with us here. We will now bring on our other special guest, which is Jose. Jose, you want to join us? Um, and since we dove into one movie with Julie, now I get to be a fanboy and ask that you give us a few little tidbits from the set of Desperately Seeking Susan. And how did you get involved with that film? And tell us a little bit about that because I love that movie in the eighties with Madonna. <laughs> oh, you're hang on, you're on mute. Got to activate your microphone. Well, what I said was, uh-oh, I have stories. <laughs> Perfect. That's what we're here for. I hope they're all ABC structured. <laughs> hey, could I, but could I, can I ask uh, Julie a quick question, Andy? Sure, go for it. I'm already but, being disrupted. But, That's a but. But, but, but could but, I ask? But it's uh, your but, turn. <laughs> go for it. Um, you know, just because of the impact that Milagro had on so many people, Julie Clausen being one among us. Um, were you active in the farm workers um, movement before the movie or did the movie itself raise your consciousness? Well, I'm gonna answer as, as Sandy Meisner. Was I active in the farm workers movement before I did Milagro or did Milagro <laughs> raise my consciousness? Yes, yes, that's the question. Yes, that's the question. Yes, that's the question, Julie. It sounds like you're getting annoyed that I'm asking the question uh, that you asked me. You think I'm getting annoyed? I think you're getting annoyed. You think I'm getting annoyed? That's very curious. I think you're getting annoyed. Uh, okay, so you think I'm getting annoyed. Okay, so I think you're getting annoyed. Okay, so we've settled that. You think I'm getting annoyed. I think you're getting annoyed. I thought we've settled it. You think I'm getting annoyed. Now I'm getting annoyed. <laughs> Randy, right. you're the director. You get, you get, you get, you get, you have to I'm, I'm not calling cut. Want. No, this, this is awesome. This is, <laughs> this is borderline annoying. Okay, here's, here's a, an aside to the audience. We were instructed that we, since we both studied with Sanford Meisner himself, that we were to do a bit of the repetition exercise. So I jumped in. All right, to answer your question, Milagro, I remember the moment when my phone rang and it was Luis Valdez who had directed me in Zoot Suit on Broadway. And he said, Julie, since you just were in Milagro Beanfield War and since I know you, I wanted to invite you and the rest of the cast of Zoot Suit, the Broadway version and the Pantages version up to the farm bell Delano to meet Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and we all drove up there and we, he, he took us under his wing. And he said, we're starting a speaker's tour of East LA College and all the different supermarkets. And we're gonna do, I'm gonna do a year long fast, he said. And then every three days, I want a different celebrity to fast and then have a press conference and take the, a necklace that I have downstairs and give it to the other celebrity at a press conference in front of a supermarket where they're boycotting grapes. And we kept that fast and that grape boycott going for a year. I got it from Danny Glover. I gave it to the mayor of San Diego and we had the, it was an amazing uh, action. 
call to action. So that's mm. how I got deeply involved with Farm Workers Justice and United Farm Workers. And, and I was raised in New York and New Jersey and I had a, you know, a purple thumb. So I was much more of an urban kid. But uh, now I have chirimoyas growing, I have goji berries growing, I have figs growing, and I have blackberries growing and bananas growing. So, um, but they have a kind of fungus. So maybe I should ask Julie Clausen, ah, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my answer. Oh, that's, that's, that's a, that thing. I'm, ha I'm, I'm very happy I asked that question because, you know, the rest of the audience, you know, Randy may know, but they may not be aware. Just as recently as a, as a couple of weeks ago, Julie, you know, was was quite active in in the movement, and introduced um, at the annual reception and fundraiser and award ceremony for uh, farm workers justice. Uh, Julie invited um, me to it, me and my my wife Marisol to attend the um, that event. And she introduced uh, Dolores Huerta to the audience that evening. And it was very passionate and uh, very moving evening. And so I was very impressed of your activity and your recognition within that movement. And since we're starting with Milagro Beanfield, I just wonder, but, you know, because so many actors, you take like Gary Sinise, who's now a big veterans activist. And you, I just wonder how involved they have been they had been before they actually worked on the movie. So it's, it's fascinating that through art, you seems like it contributed to your life significantly. Yeah, I mean, I think that because we're of the hippie generation, I think that we, uh, I, I grew up, my parents were Unitarian and I grew up with a certain a responsibility for um, humane practices and uh, Unitarianism includes a lot of social justice in their doctrine. They don't really, they don't have a dogma or a doctrine, but it's, um, it, it's a humanistic um, philosophy and some people are not, are agnostic. Um, so I grew up with that, you know, one of my first boyfriends was one of the founders of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. So, you know, when I was 18, 19, I was reading the Pentagon Papers. So I, I, I've always had a bit of a, a, a political bent. Um, and then I, I channel it into my art. And now I'm, I, I channel the humanitarianism more into my meditation and teaching. Um, let's okay well, hang, hang on let's let's use that as a focal point right there when you're 18 19 or whenever that was when you um were in san and the actors uh was it the actors playhouse theater the um, neighborhood playhouse neighborhood, neighborhood playhouse, playhouse yeah. exactly with sanford meisner and julie tell us how you got into his class and program and then jose you'll come along and tell your experience as well because you and both answer my question about desperately seeking susan Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, God, we didn't get around to that. We will, though. But now that we're we'll, on to we'll my... We'll find that. We'll find yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find exactly. We'll find we're laying down the foundation to get back to that question. But um, I, I think there's something to do with the fact that both of you are Meisner trained. And then when the ABT came along, you both connected with it. And automatically, I think there's that's not a coincidence. So, Julie, how did you happen to um, end up in the classroom with Sanford Meisner? I think I stumbled into it. At that point in my life, there was no plan. Um, I, I was not a, I was an A student or incomplete throughout high school in the last few years of high school. So um, if I didn't like something, I just didn't bother. And then I, so when it was time to go to college, I got into a community college in Newark, which was phenomenal because Newark is, in the late 70s or the, the mid 70s was a really vital cultural center. And I took some acting and anthropology and political science classes there that I still remember. And then I did a couple of plays off off Broadway with a transvestite group called from the Coquettes called um, uh, Gossamer Wings. And then um, I, I, then I, I don't know how I found out about Neighborhood Playhouse, but I wanted to be Isadora Duncan when I grew up. So I knew that Martha Graham had been the teacher there and when she was still alive. So I applied 
And instead of going to um, college, I've, I did a, a semester or two at the community college in Newark and then applied to Neighborhood Playhouse. And they wanted you to do nothing else that year. And it was so intense to study with Freddie Caraman three days a week and Sanford Meisner two days a week and these modern dance classes that are gram based and ballet classes by Dorothy Bird Villard and then um, Edith Skinner uh, speak with distinction. Um, let, let me let me ask you, d did you have to pay tuition there or was it supported? Yes. Oh, yeah, you had to pay tuition. But it was it was about I mean in those days nothing was that expensive and um, at that point my parents were were helping me. Um, so how how did you get in? How did you get in, Jose Angel? Um, I was at a crossroads um, in the last month or so of my college experience at the University of Vermont, um, and I had. Um, I had a real problem because my junior year in college, I did um, a, a VISTA volunteership and got um, credit from the school for my off-campus work. Uh, I was a communications major and I worked to coordinate a two-way television network for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was stationed at the Vermont State Maximum Security Prison for a year working with the inmates. And because it was the Maximum Security Prison and Vermont had a community correctional um, um, system, only the most uh, long-term and the most dangerous inmates were at the Vermont Maximum Security Prison at Windsor, which also happened to be the oldest maximum security prison in the United States. So. I did that my junior year and I went back to school in my senior year. And um, I was scheduled to do that for a year and three months. But after a year, I got so, I, it wasn't burnt out. It was just so, um, such a grind to work with <clears throat> all of these, um, you know, it taught me so many lessons about the people that are in prison or poor people. And, um, I was the only person of color. Actually, there was one inmate of color there, but I was, you know, myself and he were the only people of color in the prison. That so was really intense. And um, I just, after a year, I, I, I spoke to the, all the people that supervised me, both in the Department of Corrections and um, the university that I needed to escape basically. And, um, and, but in the last months of doing that, <clears throat> Martin Sheen was coming through New England um, to promote his movie, Badlands. And um, it was an extraordinary movie. And he did a lecture at it at the University of Vermont. And um, I went up to see the lecture and I asked him a few questions from the audience. And he was very generous with his, um, responses to me and on the way when the whole thing broke down and he was walking down the aisle we were seen to be walking together i asked him a few questions and i you know he was an actor and he and badlands is like an extraordinary movie and an extraordinary performance and i just kind of got starstruck to some extent of just meeting him and talking to him he's so personable and he's such a and i learned that he was such a nice guy he's the nicest and, guy in the world and, and very socially conscious um yeah. that i went back down to um the prison bound to windsor which was 90 miles away from campus and i told um i told some colleagues of mine who were planning to do a documentary about the closing of this um oldest prison in the United States, what just happened with Martin Sheen. And um, they said, well, he's coming to Dartmouth tomorrow. And you think he'd like maybe narrate our film? And I said, I, him and I hit it off. So I'll, you know, I'll do what I can. So sure enough, I went to the Hanover Inn where he was staying and I talked to his publicist 
told her what I just told you and that we were doing this movie about the closing of the oldest maximum security prison in the United States. And she said, um, well, I'll mention it to Martin. And um, if, you know, if he's, in, if he's interested, um, you know, I'll let you know and meet us here and we'll take it from there tomorrow after he does his talk. And I said, listen, I can have publicity there. I can have press there. Cause I'd been working there for almost a whole year now. And I had contacts with the reporters and I was producing television programs, educational programs for the inmates at the prison and actually producing educational programs from the inmates to the community. It was two-way TV. So I had a lot of, you know, I was, I learned to be a producer. I, I didn't even know what a producer was, but that's what I was doing. And um, sure enough, she got back to me and said, oh, I said to her, Oh, so she said to me, um, don't worry about press. If Martin wants to do it, he doesn't need publicity for it. He'll just do it. And I was like, wow. So she got back to me and she said he's willing to do it. So after the talk at Dartmouth, meet us at the Hanover Inn. And I took him to the prison uh, with two of my other crew members, with a director and one of the producers, and inmates that were like um, the hardest to get to, the hardest to be around, the most dangerous. When I walked into the prison, you know, um, unit with him, they became like little babies. They just They're amazing. <laughs> they just went up wow. to him and asked him questions, Great and they knew. They knew of his other work. They knew of his work as something called the California Kid. Mm. And they just were eating out of his hand. And He's he made my life there so much easier. He agreed you know, to what he, he um, when I was I was in graduate school living in Winthrop House at Harvard, and he was on tour with Apocalypse Now. And oh. for some reason, one day I came back from the lab or something and went in the dining hall and all these guys were there and he had shown up out of nowhere in the junior common room there and just talked to a whole bunch of the undergraduates. And at one point he told them that he did uh, 500 pushups a day and somebody doubted him and then he <laughs> dropped to the floor and did hundred pushups instantly. Oh and everybody God. at dinner that night was like, Sheen, Sheen, 500 pushups a day. I'm going to start doing that every single day. Um, <laughs> the guy's amazing. Uh, amazing guy. guy. This is this is exactly why Randy brought Jose Angel and me together in this podcast because it is uncanny the coincidences in our odyssey in our life journey. Not only are we of Cuban uh, roots, but um, after I finished studying with Sandy Meisner, I pounded the pavement in Manhattan and looking for a theater job. And the first one that I booked was at a place called Cell Block Theater, where Ray Gordon, one of the fathers of oh, wow. drama therapy, trained me to work with ex-cons. And they were just out of prison where they'd been in for 10 years or longer. And I became the drama therapist there for four years. And it, and wow. it, it paid twelve fifty an hour, which was really big in those days. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, you know, really. But basically, I did improvisation with them for four years on on uh, behavior modification for control of aggression. Oh. Like I would come up with scenarios and right before they were about to just like spam somebody, uh, they would they would um, they would clap their hands. I don't know how sensitive this mic is, but they would clap their hands a lot until the and, and then they would exhale you know in those days and nowadays i wouldn't have them clap because that just raises the stress hormones anyway I um, hey, let, uh, julie i'm gonna i want to do something really horrible and mean to you right now Go for um, it. can you in one abt sentence tell us Sam, who sanford meisner was and why he was interesting to know about uh, give us a one sentence abt about sanford meisner sanford meisner was an actor from the group theater in American theater history, but because he had such corrosive cancer of his larynx when he was teaching us, he was the meanest person I had ever met in my life. Therefore, 
I would want I would want the earth to open up and swallow me whole every single day when I studied with him. Oh, well, oh, all right, <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, now Jose, he has now set the bar up there. Now you've got to give us another ABT about Sanford Meisner. Go for it. Um, remember, I have two stories to catch up on. One of them is desperately <laughs> seeking Susan, and, and the other is how I got to the neighborhood playhouse. Okay, duly noted. Jen will keep track of the backlog. Okay, but I'm gonna hijack, I'm gonna hijack this whole thing once again myself with asking Julie a question. Sorry, Randy, but um, Julie, um, when you worked with um, the inmates for those four years, did you ever come across something called ATV? Alter mm -hmm. ATV alternatives to violence. It's formed no. by the Quakers that that mm -hmm. we're all about doing the same kind of work. Anyway. That's another no, story. I, I did the system that Ray Gordon taught us and we went into Rikers and I worked with the death row inmates and we did oh, certain wow. exercises. And those are the ones that I, I didn't want to go back. I was the only woman in the room, both Ray and a, a, a former inmate were with me who were from cell block. And then we did South Pacific with the women inmates playing all the roles and the oh staff God. playing the chorus. And, and there was, they were all in loose in the auditorium and it was the heyday of like more free prison system. The, the, there were guards, yes, but all the women were just sitting in the, in the bleachers in the auditorium and we were doing South Pacific and some of the women had fabulous voices and you should have heard them rock. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. Oh my goodness, <laughs> but, I bet they had motivation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, but, okay, but, so okay, but you can't get away with scooching out on your ABT example. That's right. Back to I Sanford. Will. Exactly. I will. I will. Yep. I will. Pressure's but, on. but here's the thing. Julie just gave a great story about this whole prison experience. So, but I have to just say that Martin Sheen agreed to narrate our film. He went back to California. He said, in a month, I'll be back to do something to watch my friend Al Pacino in a play uh, up there. He's doing Richard III in Boston. Come pick me up. I'll come up. I'll spend a weekend with you narrating, doing narration for your film. And that, that happened. Um, the director went down to pick him up. My brother and I, who was very young at the time, um, who he was a juvenile delinquent. He came to live with me in Vermont. Um, him and I brought Martin Sheen back to Boston and had a great conversation with him. And him and I stayed in touch with each other for a few years after that. And I'll put that on. Well, actually, it's a perfect segue. So Sanford Meisner, yes. this is part of what led me to go to the neighborhood playhouse. So but I'll, I'll, I'll be cooperative and I'll say that my ABT about Sanford Meisner would be that I had really no clue about what the craft of acting was until I entered the Neighborhood Playhouse um, School of Theater. My friggin' robot thing is going off. The, uh, my, but, but my robot. See, this is, this, is, this is what Bud is all about, man. I have a problem. I have to solve. The friggin' robot is going. Do you hear it? I was hearing that high-pitched um, sound. That's you, I was texting Matt about. What is that high-pitched noise? That must be your robot. Well, right now. In any case, if it's too <laughs> distracting, let me know. So anyway, so I entered the neighborhood playhouse without knowing um, anything about the craft of acting. And during my two years there, like Julie, I had Sandy for two or three classes a week. And one of the other teachers there about two times or three times a week. And it changed my life in so far as I went from knowing nothing to as soon as I got out of the neighborhood playhouse, I found myself working at the center of the mainstream of theater and even motion pictures and um, television even. But I do not, I do not um, appreciate some of the cruelty with which his extraordinary teacher teachings 
were dispensed even by him and by some of the teachers. See, that cruelty yes. yeah, we're gonna, has we're, been handed do down that. as well as it being yes. part of the, the, the oh, okay, pedagogy, okay. Right. and that's right. really unfortunate. Yeah, let me, let me pick up on that then. So you guys were doing that back then in the mid 90s, I got put into this Meisner program in Santa Monica by my screenwriter buddy who was in the business. And he said, trust me, take this thing. It'll be real, it's really tremendous. And the teacher's very intense. I gotta warn you, you know, she's really fierce. But if you hang in there, you'll get a lot out of it. And so on the first night, she picked me out of the whole group of students. I was the older guy, the professor guy. And she targeted me and unloaded on me in a way that in public has never happened in my entire life before or after. And it was straight exactly what you're talking about. It's straight out of that Meisner tradition, which is just this rage. And I'd never, you know, I wasn't ready for it at all. I had to stand there in front of these 25 howling students for 15 minutes as she screamed her lung out with, lungs out with every other word, the F word. Um, but for me, you know, it was cruel and abusive. And yet, I honestly believe as a scientist and academic, I never would have made this conversion into what I do today had I not been confronted that way to break through because it took me five to 10 to 15 to 20 years to process what happened that night in a single instant, which was she was saying, you're an academic, you don't listen, you, you're caught up in your head, you think you know everything. And as she was screaming that at me, all I was thinking was, you're an idiot, you're wrong, you're stupid. And I was exactly what she was saying. I was not listening to anything that night. She let me stay in the class, even though she kicked me out that night, she let me get back in. And slowly over the course of a year, I began to grasp some of this stuff. And now I've been on this mission ever since then. And now I'm up against the science world that doesn't listen. I am exactly that person of that night is the whole science world, which doesn't listen to so much of this stuff on communication. And so the other thing to say was, you know, what I witnessed, I'm sure you guys did as well. The break, breakthrough moment for everybody in our class, and, you know, most of them were really bad actors, but the few that made some major breakthroughs, it always happened through hatred and anger, so, you know, sad to say, but it was their night where they had a fit of rage, some monologue they went into that was screaming all F you, F you, F you. And that was the moment where they finally would lose themselves and wake up and, oh my God, I'm in front of an audience and things like that. And as one instructor said to us at one point, you know, good spirits are so much harder than this hatred and anger stuff. And yet it's the elementary break in um, emotion that most people find their first way into real acting is through, through, the, through the butt, basically, through the contradiction, through the anger, the rage, all that sort of stuff. And let's talk about that a little bit. Um, did, to what extent did Meisner know that and use that? And that's why it translated into him being such a mean and vicious person. Um, Julie, take it from there. But we only have a few minutes. So I want to do popcorn style. Everybody has to give a mean Meisner moment. Okay, I'll start. Yes. I have three. So I had to do a, you have to start with uh, activity. So I thought I was being very creative as the only um, diverse person in the class of 20 students. I did lip syncing to Ima Sumac on a 33. I brought in my record player. I put Ima Sumac on, who's a Peruvian singer who can sing eight octaves. And he had never heard of her. And I was there in my long hippie dress doing this Ima Sumac, uh, Sumac lip syncing and trying to get it just right. And then somebody knocks on the door and they have a need from me and I expect somebody else. And then the repetition act uh, exercise starts. And this is the entire year one. So he ripped me to smithereens and I was not raised by parents who were that direct and, and assertive or aggressive or, or disciplinarian or-, or Wait, give us, give us a sample specifically. What did he say? Well, at one point he said, I've, I had studied ballet from second grade and then a lot of Merce Cunningham and, and a lot of modern dance. And I was really into, you know, dance. And my minor in college was ultimately choreography. He said, Julie, I just want to pick you up by your feet and turn you upside down and shake you. But he said it in a way that made me cry. I mean, nowadays, of course, I like hearing good critique. And he was right, of course, I was probably too. He said, not every character is going to, you know, lift their balhue up to infinity. You know, not every character has a shushum nanari. Not every character has good posture. So, um, but, but whatever, he saw that. I needed to hear that. But the way he said it was so debasing. Next. <laughs> Jose. Um, 
your well, one specific you see, story. I don't, I don't, when I say the cruelty, and I want to speak to your point as well, Randy, I didn't have this abundance of cruelty foisted on me from Sandy insofar as, you know, saying anything offensive to me or saying um, anything debasing or anything of that nature. What I, when I say the cruelty is that he was absolutely, and all of his teachers were taught to be absolutely and totally intolerant of anything intellectual mm -hmm. and anything that didn't ring true. Well, and you see how that ties in with me. That's what she smelled on me that first night yes. was, oh my God, here's somebody intellectual. Yes. Yes. And if you're dealing with, a, you know, bringing that kind of an approach with the ABT to science, you're going to run into things because the kids who had the most, and I, I say cruelty, the kids who had the most difficult time at the neighborhood playhouse was the kids that had studied acting in college because their training tended to be theoretical and intellectual and they were trying to do those things i mean even me who acted very little in college when i tried to do the things that i learned in college which tended to be intellectual and they would just they were they were just shut down and destroyed in the most okay, so, unkind so give us, of ways give us one specific moment of of meisner sanford meisner in action that you saw that, that was really mean and vicious but but see he well i can't characterize him that way i can't characterize i didn't have this experience julie i didn't have the experience of him being mean and vicious i mean the, the most mean and vicious things that sandy would do to me is because i personally was a somewhat of a pain in the ass in other words he would give me a critique you know in front of the class that was really on point, but I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the critique. So the way you're taught at the Neighborhood Playhouse is don't worry about understanding it. Just keep doing this exercise over and over and over again, and you'll get it in your body. You'll get it in your soul. So I would do things, excuse me, Julie? It's true. Right. So I would do things like not understanding it, I would go to the table where he taught, which was like a sacred, was like a sacred altar. And I'd ask him for clarification. <laughs> and he told me to get lost. After the class, I'd go to his, and Julie could appreciate how crazy this was. I would go to the teacher's lounge and knock on the door. And, you know, a, one of his teachers would open the door and say, go away, go away. And I'd say, no, 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 I need, I have a question for Mr. Meisner. I need, you know, to understand this thing. So him and I had a, but I can't, you know, he just was never, he was cruel to other people. See, I could, I did the work. Now let me get to your point and I want to bounce it off of Julie, Randy, because there's yeah. something in the, in the technique itself that produces conflict. So when you say that they made these breakthroughs when they got angry and so on and yeah. so forth, the way the exercise that Julie's describing was set up, that if someone is in the room doing something very difficult and that matters a great deal to them, every exercise, once you're teamed up with a partner, has a but built into it. But this person is coming to the door to interrupt you. And yeah. they but want I something. somebody else. Right, and you expect somebody else. And they want something from you. So there's a butt built into the exercise that produces conflict yeah. and produces anger. So when, you when, when, so what you're saying makes sense. But I'll tell you what, if Julie and I continued to do that repetition game that mm -hmm. she invited me to play with her, we would have eventually got into a thing. We would yeah. have gotten into a thing. We yeah, would have yeah. definitely gotten into a thing because we would have definitely gotten into a thing. All right, let, let's let's, uh, <laughs> let's have all right, let's have Julie. Get, okay, hang on. Let's have Julie get into a thing right now. And while she does, um, Jose, can you mute um, while she's talking because we're picking up that ringing coming off your robot or something like that. So, oh no, the robot is dead. I, 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 My phone rang because I had oh, no, no. It's a it's a high pitch ringing, but anyhow, if you can mute when you're not talking, to Jose. I want so a take, robot. I really need a robot. <laughs> take away, <laughs> Julie. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, Freddie Caraman. Same one. That, it doesn't have a face and arms and. You feet. Yeah, the, yeah, the robot okay. back. I got the same one. We'll, we'll get to that. You'll send me the link, as they say nowadays. Yes. Um, all right. 
I was the person coming to the door. Freddie Caraman, one of the star teachers in that, the year I was there, he had three teachers, Bill Esper, Freddie Caraman, and Bill Alderman, Alderson, Alderman. Anyway, Freddie Caraman was inside with the class. So I was the one coming to ask my scene partner something, and I knew what I wanted, like money for an abortion or something like that. It was big those days. So when I opened the door, Freddie had instructed the person inside to literally spit in my face. Oh, God, there you go. <laughs> spit in my face. And I, I, and I even then gave them the benefit of the effing doubt. I mean, even then, I, you know, did you, yeah. maybe you didn't mean to spit in my face. <laughs> maybe you were about to sneeze or just splattered like James Earl Jones when he's acting and you're in the front row. Um, but, and then Freddie said, don't you get it? That we really want to poke at you to get all that anger out. And I just did not come from a family where people express their anger. Unlike most people, I know, poor me. But <laughs> um, And right after I finished, I booked John Cassavetti's Gloria, which is the angriest role I've ever played. So um, it, it did unleash something in me. because, And now I'm, you know, a psychotherapist, marriage family therapist, yoga therapist, who's all about equanimity and harmony. But, you know, I, I do have that place that if somebody literally spits in my face, I am going to, you know, oh. uh, yeah. respond appropriately. Okay, so, all right. So now it's about that. I have to put in yes. a disclaimer just for ethical. Yes reasons i do not believe that you need to rip somebody i know the reins in order to have someone be trained as a good actor because when i left sanford meisner i we we uh, some of us formed a repertory company led by joan lang who was our our voice production teacher at neighborhood playhouse and she taught at yale and then I auditioned to get in with Uta Hagen and Uta Hagen had all the sixth sense. She saw it all and she had a kind, more maternal style of teaching and I stayed with her for years. And I credit her with being able to really help me break down a scene, do scene study, do character building. Her book, Respect for Acting is extraordinary. Yeah. So I do, I do not condone these okay, divas, but now, these divas who think that they oh, can get away. Oh, absolutely, with absolutely. And, and there were refugees from that course that, uh, you know, quit and had damage for the rest of their life, probably from the things that went on. That was just really well established. But now that said, let me add in another little tidbit I think both of you will, will connect with, which is that same summer, I worked as a production assistant on a Patrick Swayze movie and I ended up working with the casting director there and there was one day where we brought in a whole bunch of A-level actors that were you know not major names but I mean I guess A minus or something and I sat there waiting in the waiting room with them and I began quizzing them they were all like guys in their early 30s and I said you know what was the one best acting course you had what's the one course to take and every one of them had the same answer which I'm sure the two of you would have the answer there's no one best course you have to take a whole smorgasbord of different courses and from each one you get certain things and you get something from Meisner, you get something from Uta Hagen and all of them. And out of that, you shape the whole body of your, your, your craft. Is that not the case for the both of you as well? Uh, Jose, Jose, you're now muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, what's the question? Uh, is it not the case that there is no one acting teacher that you, you put together over the course of a training and a career a variety of things you learn from a variety of instructors. In my experience, individuals gravitate towards the teachers that are most suitable for them. For some people, it's someone like Sandy. For some people, it's someone mm -hmm. like the teacher you had. And I don't equate that kind of treatment. That's to, an interesting answer. That, that's I, an I don't. I don't, I don't equate that kind of treatment. Yeah. With Sanford Meisner's approach. He has a very autocratic approach that's been handed down. And then you have certain people with really weird personalities and weird power yeah. trips and weird psychologies that then take that autocratism into areas that are totally inappropriate, just how Julie said. So anyway, you know, that was my foundation. And after 
studying with Sandy. I studied with Stella for a year or two, um, mainly you know her technique class, but, but I had to leave it because I got work. But her script interpretation class, I, I think Julie was probably in the city when that was going on. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary experience to um, be taught me, me... script interpretation from her. But that was my foundation. The only other yeah. person I ever worked with and studied with was Paul Sills, um, who, whose teaching of Viola Spolin's work was so in alignment with Sandy's reality of doing because you know all the games as Julie's nodding have a point of concentration which is basically an action to perform and that's what Sandy taught brilliantly is how to how acting and drama has to do with you know accomplishing an action accomplishing something um, um, let, 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 let me jump in so for one minute here because those, are my, own, those are my only three teachers oh, okay all right so let me um, Mira, Rostova, Mira Rostova did you ever work with Mira Rostova Julie no, out here I work with Bobby Lewis. And oh, he was amazing too, right? Bobby Lewis taught the left page, where if the right side of your page is your dialogue, then the left part of the page, you make three columns, your overall intention, your moment-to-moment -moment intention, and a sensory uh, prompt that'll help get you there. So uh, okay, all right, we're, we're getting into actors class here. This is the ABT Time podcast. So I'm going to assert <laughs> myself now and take the floor oh, back. Right. But because I wanted to have a half a moment here with Jen on, on a, a note that you made there, Jose, that's really, really interesting, which is mm -hmm. um, you had said that different people gravitate towards different types of instructors. And yeah, I think in so. that, that same regard, for example, uh, when I was doing my PhD, there was a professor in my department who was horribly hard-driven, abusive, antisocial, and just almost military in his training of science. And there were some graduate students that couldn't get enough of that guy. The harder he beat on them, the more, thank you, sir, may I have another. And there were others who were absolutely destroyed by him and quit science and gave up on their whole careers because he was so abusive. And you saw exactly that split. We're like, wait a second, this one person can't get enough of him. The other are crushed by him. Um, and Jen, you got any similar observations in the science career? That, that people, you know, creative types need more sensitive instruction and there are some more structured discipline types that really rise to that kind of forcefulness. You've seen any I, of that? I just think you see it all the time. I mean, in, in everyday life, you see people gravitating towards different teaching methods and different ways of understanding. And I would also argue that's why science communication, which um, Randy and I both think about a lot, has to be diverse because if we want to reach different people and connect with different audiences and bring different people into a, a scientific way of thinking, whether it's about climate change or the pandemic, we have to do it in different ways. So that's why music is so important. That's why art's so important. That's why movies are so important. That's why books are so important. That's why infographics are so important. You know, you're going to connect with different people in different ways, whether it's an acting class or a PhD advisor or somebody communicating science because we're, we're just, you know, we are diverse in the way we think. And by the way, one little side note on that from this morning that I tweeted about, which is I've never been that much of a oh, fan yeah. of Greta Thunberg. Greta. Yes. But then this morning there was this short speech. She gave seven minute speech. I counted the ands and the buts. And lo and behold, I mean, it was a really forceful, well-structured argument, argued speech and I yep. think that when she was a little younger, it was kind of one dimensional, but I think she's beginning to mature into more structured argumentation that is holding people's feet to the fire. It really was great. It had nine butts and 26 ands for a narrative index of 35, which is really powerful. And you yes. could feel it. It was really good argumentation. Either somebody's working with her or she's starting to get the chops into how to put these arguments together. Um, so for the first time, I found myself a, a total fan. Up until now, I've never been that thrilled with her. But that's interesting side note. But it gets us back to the ABT dynamic. And let's see, we're, we're coming to the, we could go on for hours here. As we did at lunch, by the way, um, about three months ago, I took these two folks to lunch and they had never met each other. And we sat there for two hours and I just didn't say much of anything. And every 15 minutes, they would pause and turn to me, don't you want to be part of this conversation? I said, no, this is awesome. Just listening to the two of you. And I finally left them there and they went on for another hour, I think. So we could go on for hours and hours. I've got one question I want to ask both of you really quickly, which is uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the New York Times had a whole article about the Latino community, this, that, and the other thing about the Latino community, blah, 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 blah. Not a mention in that a whole feature article about Latinx. What's your thoughts on that term, Lat Lat? 
Latinx or Latinx versus well, Latino? You know, I host a I host a clubhouse room on Sundays from five yes. to seven for the next two weeks for Hispanic. And what, and what is Clubhouse? Clubhouse is an app, but you should know this. But who introduced you to it? <laughs> oh, Randy told me about Clubhouse. There you go. Therefore, um, anyway, everybody who comes on to our Hispanic Heritage Month room celebrate. Uh, says, why are you calling it Hispanic Heritage Month? It leaves out Brazilians who are Portuguese, and it leaves out some of the 18 uh, Spanish-speaking countries because um, Hispanic, you know, there's a whole, everyone wants to be represented. And we want Afro-Latinos, we want um, Chicanos, we want um, uh, everyone to feel included, and that's part of the conversation. So anyone on Clubhouse, join us the next two Sundays from 5 to 7 Pacific Standard Time. So I don't get caught up in the verbiage, but I wanted to ask you a question. How do you feel about the narrative index in the hands of the wrong people? It's kind of a really good tool, but the, the wrong people can use it and I see using it. And how do you feel about that? Did you see my tweet this morning? Um, no. I, I said her score was 35. That's in the same company with great communicators like dot, 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 Michael Crichton who became a climate skeptic at the end of his career. And there you go, exactly, which was, and my whole lesson to the science world that they don't want to listen to is you had this guy for 25 years offering his services to you people. And all you did was treat him like a clown from Hollywood. And then eventually he got fed up and he went to the dark side and you'd better make it, take advantage of resources while they're there. And you're right. They all, it's, it's about narrative. I mean, we can go on and on with that, but it's, it's all narrative now. And people talk about, well, we've got the facts. We've got the truth. They think they've got the facts. They've got the truth. It's just, who can put this stuff together in a more compelling way using all these basic principles of, of communication, but that goes on and on and on. Um, and we're getting near the end here and we absolutely must get um, a few tidbits about Desperately Seeking Susan. So uh, Jose, give us a little bit of remembrance. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna hijack it to say that Madonna couldn't stay off my lap when we were uh, shooting our scenes, um, which is actually true. Which is actually yeah. true. Which is actually true. Her and I, um, I worked on the movie the first three days that it was in production. So she and I shared a tr uh, Winnebago. She was nobody as an actress at the time, so she that was, was her sharing, first acting role, right? She was. That was her first acting role, yeah. Um, yeah. So she shared a Winnebago with a nobody like myself. And so uh, the, she had one side of the Winnebago, I had the other side of the Winnebago. And there's so many stories, but the bottom line is that um, it, it was a pleasure working with her because she was very down to earth. And, you know, she, she asked me, you know, so what, so what do you want to do, Jose? And I said, I want to leave show business and work with young people. That's what I want to do. I said, what do you want to do, Madonna? She said, I want to rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> no bones about it. She really did, man. She said that like day one yeah. of, us, of, of Desperately Seeking Susan. And yeah. she, she would have a limousine and a script in her hand for some other project waiting for her every day after we wrapped those first three days. She was, you know, she was on a rocket ship to wherever she went, you know, yeah. which is a trait that most big stars basically have. Um, and then when we shot our scenes, there was the fact that she was so forward with me that in this day of, you know, the whole Me Too movement, I left working with her thinking, now that's really weird. If I was a man and I treated her the way she just treated me would that be okay i mean she was just extra i mean everything i have to say about working with her is kind of trite but she was extraordinarily forward yeah. and i have some you know gory details of that forwardness but you know we worked together for three days i had a really uh, fine time with her and i had a great time working on the movie and there's things related to the meisner technique actually that came to fruition in the shooting of the scenes. Um, so I'm trying to wrap it up 
quickly. Do you have any well, specific you know, questions and, and about there, that? There are, there are lots of articles written about her early years about how incredibly ambitious she was, you know, mm -hmm. ethical or not. But she just clearly was driven from when she was performing in music clubs and things in New York City. You know, that was really the thing that I think everybody realized that she was exactly yeah. what she said. She was determined to get to the top one way or the other. And you don't need to go into those stories, but that just was her. Well, trait. no, she she was she yeah. didn't you know, she wasn't. I wasn't one of her conquests yeah. or anything like that. It's just that she was like really in my body, on my body, you know, right. right before we shot a scene. So most of what was going on between us on camera was like, yeah, who the hell do you think you are? I mean, I had to use it. As Julie will tell you, you know, when things are going on, you can't let them distract you. So you have to use them. And my, my attitude towards her in the scenes you know, had a lot to do with, um, you know, who, who in the world do you think you are? Um, okay, so we hardly ever even got back around to ABT type stuff, but we certainly had a lot of fun <laughs> and we could go on for hours on this. And the only solution is I will definitely have you guys back again in the not too distant future. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of a really interesting, another guest to bring in to join the two of you to talk about, um, especially the, the activism stuff in, in the early years. Um, no, but here's okay, the thing. it's Ju final wrap up Ju time. Ju is this Ju your final comment? Julie looks, Ju Julie looks like she's in almost in a state of shock at my Madonna story. What, what do you make of that? There were five different responses I was going to have, mm -hmm. and I am filtering them all. I, I, you know, but did you know that Jose Angel's wife, Marisol, made my mala, which has 108 beads so that you can it, meditate. I am breathing in. I am pausing. I am breathing out. I am pausing. Do you like the way I segued away from the Me Too story? <laughs> issue and why 108 is that a specific number it's a specific number for meditation and also i do have to share i was going to use this as a referee but it never got that intense i got a love tuner and it's to a tune so will you let me attune everybody for my closing statement yes please Five hundred and twenty six hertz. Zoom, <laughs> Zoom, didn't Zoom didn't pick it up, Julie. We didn't hear it. Oh, you didn't hear it? We, we, no. Is that is that the trick? No, you're kidding. It was the, silence. The, the, the Zoom the Zoom microphone is not sensitive to pick that up, Julie. I'm so sorry. As much as you blow, nothing's going to happen. Why? You blew it. <laughs> it's like a dog whistle. Like yeah, we can exactly. hear, but the dogs can. I can hear my neighbor's okay. dog barking right now. <laughs> All right, the scientists need to explain this to me. I'm like in a state of a state of shock. We can't go until you tell me why you can't hear this. Uh, there's a noise threshold. There's a noise threshold needed to activate the Zoom microphone. You're not breaking the noise threshold with that. It's too slow. The the. It's sound too soft. Noise. It's too quiet. Not enough energy. Oh yeah, we we caught a tiny little <laughs> start. It sounds like a kazoo. <laughs> <Jeez>. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we got to wrap this up. Um, Randy, were we disruptive enough? That was that was awesome. <laughs> it was really really good. Uh, Jen, you got a final statement to wrap this all up with. Um, uh, I just want to get them both back because like you did at your lunch, I just sat here listening and in reveling in the stories. So I have lots of questions, but there were today wasn't the day to ask them. So I look forward to seeing you both again soon. Yeah, okay. it's like, you know, I know a bunch of different actors. I could grab any random two together, but these two folks just mesh, as they were saying, you know, so much in their background, their heritage and all that sort of stuff. We could go on for hours and hours. Well, there. you know, I, and, since, and I didn't get we... to hear from Julie about Barry Humphreys. So I'm sorry. Barry oh, Humphreys grew up about geez. three right. streets away teaser, from that's... where I grew up. So you got to come back, Julie. So, that, that so, is exactly so, where so, it so, with, That's a cliffhanger. We started with, so Julie, you have a, a green shirt. Uh oh, here we go. I have a green shirt. You have a green shirt. I have a green shirt. You have a green shirt. I have a green shirt. Well, you look like you have a green shirt. I don't have a green shirt. I said you look like you have a green shirt. I look like I have a green shirt. 
I said, yes, you look like you have a green shirt. And on that note, this will go on for the next two hours. So we will fade out. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, we'll Senator Meisner. May you rest in peace. <laughs> that was awesome. All right. All right. All right. Bye, we are everybody. done. Thanks very Bye. much. You can Bye. wrap it. Matt Bye. and... Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Jen. And thank you, Julie Clausen, if you're still thank there you, as well. Julie. Thank you, and, Julie Clausen and Matt. And, and thank you, Julie Clausen. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Randy. What a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>